Hello, and on behalf of Grant Thornton, a very warm welcome to this Building Business Resilience webinar. We've had an absolutely fantastic audience response with over 800 attendees registering for this. So wherever in the world you're watching us today, thank you so much for taking part and sharing your time with us. Well, it's no secret that business leaders in the UK are facing both political, economic and social pressures and uncertainty, the likes that we haven't seen for nearly 50 years. In fact, in the last two weeks alone, we've had some significant changes and announcements made. A new prime minister has appointed a new cabinet and they're gonna be looking to set out their stall to try and reverse current polling trends ahead of the next general election. However, Unexpected policies are being announced without the usual detail or third party scrutiny. Markets, as we've seen, are reacting in their own ways. And we've seen the pound falling and the cost of borrowing rise significantly. And just recently, the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, have waded into the debate, voicing their concerns, issuing rather blunt statements, which will come across later on. The Conservative Party conference next week potentially offers an opportunity for greater clarity over policy direction, but the volatility we've witnessed will stay in place. So with all this going on, there are some things that business leaders can do to help navigate these headwinds and be prepared for what's ahead, which is why we've called this broadcast Building Business Resilience. And we brought together a panel of Grant Thornton experts from economics, from tax, restructuring and public services to help understand and also unpick what this all means for business leaders. So now let's meet the panel. And first, I'd like to welcome uh, Shellyan Horn. She's an economics partner, of course, with Grant Thornton. And I know you provide expertise on a wide range of business, uh, Shellyan. So great to have you here. So just tell us a little bit about your role. Thanks. Yeah. So I'm a partner in our economic consulting team. Um, we advise governments and regulators on setting policy and we advise businesses on how to implement and react to some of those sort of policy and economic decisions. So you're going to be giving us the bigger picture. So looking forward to hearing your thoughts on what's happening to the economy at the moment. So welcome to you. Mm. Rachel, if I can turn to you now. Rachel Engwell is a tax partner with Grant Thornton. I know you work with a wide range of businesses. I'm sure you've had a very busy time over the last couple of weeks. I have, yes, Nadine. Um, so I'm based in the north of England, specialising in tax. And um, as you say, I do work with a wide variety of businesses across a number of sectors. I advise at the investor, corporate and individual level um, to my portfolio of international groups, private equity backed businesses, family owned businesses and UK PLCs. Well, good to have you here. Thank you very much. And Alistair Granger is Net Zero Director at Grant Thornton, but I know you've got a huge amount of experience regarding energy and business policies right at the heart of the government. So you were a civil servant in effect, weren't you, before yes. you joined Grant Thornton? Absolutely, yes. I was a senior civil servant at the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, uh, where I worked very closely uh, with a range of different ministerial teams. But most importantly, I think for this context, uh, with Kwasi Kwarteng, first when he was business uh, minister and then lastly uh, when he became secretary of state. So I worked really closely with him on a number of different uh, initiatives and schemes. So looking forward to sharing those thoughts uh, later on. Indeed, looking forward to getting some insights mm. into your thoughts on uh, some of the recent appointments as well. Great to have you here. And uh, Sentinel Aligar is a restructuring partner with Grant Thorn. And Sen, I know you've got a huge amount of experience, 20 years, and I know you're going to be tapping into consumer markets, among other things as well today for us. That's right, Nadine. Uh, so my focus is on restructuring and turnarounds. Um, I've done that for over 20 odd years and across different sectors. And it's going to be really interesting going through this conversation, sharing some of those insights. Indeed, look forward to it. So that's your panel today, bringing real knowledge and expertise to this broadcast. And so looking forward to hearing what they have to say. And I'm sure you've got lots of questions too as well. So please do start sending your questions and comments in. And you can do that throughout the broadcast via Slido. And the details should be on your screen now. So keep your questions coming in. And towards the end of the webinar, I'll try and get through as many of your questions as time permits. If there is a particular speaker that you'd like to address the question to, whether it's um, Shellyan, Rachel, Alistair or Sen, then please, if you wouldn't mind, jot down their name alongside your question and then I'll make sure I can direct it to the right person. 
OK, well, let's start by setting the scene with Shelley and by looking at how the current economic and political climate will impact business. So Shelley, I know a lot has happened, you're <laughs> smiling. I can see that over the last few weeks. So where are we now with the economy? And you talk about the last few weeks, I think we could talk about the last few hours. Yes, so, um, indeed. indeed. No, so, we, you know, as everybody knows, we're experiencing volatile economic times um, and that's driven by a unique combination of factors. So we're covering from recovering from COVID. COVID seems a long, long time ago now, but we are still recovering from COVID. Um, and there's a real change in how we go about our daily lives and sort of how, how we're consuming services. Um, the war in Ukraine um, and its, its impact on energy prices in particular and also commodity prices prices, so food, um, an increasingly tight labour market. I don't think any of us can hide away from sort of how difficult it is to recruit and retain staff at the moment. And also some of the um, surprising announcements in last week's mini budget that I think took, took most of us by surprise. Um, and this level of global uncertainty makes it really difficult to, to plan and to sort of predict where we'll be, I think this afternoon, let alone sort of next week or in the coming months. But I think what we do know is that we're in economic territory that we haven't seen for, for many years. Um, and we're likely to see an inflation driven recession. Um, and some of the interventions we've seen from the government in, in the last week or two will, will potentially soften that. But I think we will end up at some point in, in this inflation driven recession. And, you know, the government has been looking um, at tax cuts. So to address the cost of living crisis, that's some of the employee related tax cuts we've seen, some reductions in stamp duty, etc. And it's been looking to sort of reduce some of those corporate pressures as well. And I know Sam will talk about some of those so around some of the corporation taxes and crucially it's putting it um it's really placing i guess it's gamble on on productivity so it's looking at how how we can improve productivity in the uk economy some of the creations around in the um, investment zones um, how you encourage um, investment in certain areas of the UK and also looking to some of the changes to migration and visas. Um, but the market's obviously reacted with some concern. Um, as you noted, the, um, the pound's fallen to its, its lowest level against the dollar in you know, many, many, many years. Um, and there's obviously concern from, from the IMF and others as to whether this gamble will pay off. So essentially, will, will the levels of growth that the, the government is saying will will be achieved, will they, will they be sufficient to outweigh the impact on, on the national debt? Indeed, and mini budget. I know, an oxymoron I know, in many I know. ways. It was like a major budget, wasn't it? I know, and you wonder what else they've got to say in November. But yes. Yeah, indeed. Uh, or maybe next week at the <laughs> party political conference. So volatility is certainly yeah. the name of the game, yeah. isn't it? As you said, it's mm. very difficult to predict and plan for the future. But the major talking point at the moment has got to be inflation, hasn't yeah. it? Yeah. Um, yeah, and inflation sits at 10%, um, way, way above the Bank of England's 2% target. And actually, the Bank of England has been really good um, at, at hitting that 2% target in the past. It doesn't breach the target that, that often. So it's, it's really concerned about the, the breadth and depth of inflation that it's seeing. Um, and a lot of that inflation has been driven by the energy prices that I mentioned earlier. So about 30% of, of that inflation is driven by um, energy. Um, about 15% is from commodity prices, including food. Um, and then the remainder um, across the various factors but but a lot of it around the depreciation of the pounds so as the pound depreciates our imports become more expensive and that that puts pressure on inflation um and a lot of those factors are outside the government's control so outside the bank of england's control so it, it can't control those those energy prices there's nothing it can do about that and that makes it difficult for the bank of england to, to know what to do um however it's going to be particularly concerned about the budget so there's been a fiscal stimulus um, the government is putting more money into the economy. It's giving us more money to spend. And whilst in the short term, that might actually decrease inflation. So you've got the um, energy price cap. You've got some of the corporate measures that will allow businesses to absorb some of those cost increases. So in the short term, it might reduce inflation. But in the longer term, you are essentially putting putting more money into the economy and that, that will push up inflation. And that's going to be on the Bank of England's mind. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. So inflation, really, that 2% target, yes. uh, as you said, they, they've been, we are looking some way off. And, and actually what's quite interesting is that even over the last few hours, we've seen announcements coming out of the Bank of England that in the short term they're buying up bonds to shore up the market. Um, so they have certain things at the disposal, but it just shows how what extreme times we're living in at the moment. Mm. Incredible, isn't it? Um, of all those issues though that you've just mm. mentioned, it's probably the cost of energy that is front and centre of most people's minds, whether it's from a business or a household perspective. And um, recently, the government announced a major intervention to limit potential price rises. 
What impact do you think that intervention will have on inflation? And it's worth saying there have been some um, remarkable sort of um, predictions around the cost of those interventions. And we're not going to know what those interventions will be, I think, for some weeks. And I'm sure Alice will talk more about that. Um, but they do come at a sort of hu huge cost to our economy as well. And we won't know the impact of them, for, I think, for some while. But obviously what you're talking about here are the, the energy price caps and the um, attempts to sort of um, fix energy prices for consumers and for, for businesses in the shorter term. And the government's predicted that that will have a 5% impact on inflation. So inflation will be sort of 5% lower as a result. Um, in reality, that's probably near a 3%. The other 2% are sort of indirect um, impacts as a result of sort of people having cheaper, cheaper um, energy in their supply chain. Um, however, what the government hasn't stated when it came up with that 5% prediction is obviously the impact of the fiscal stimulus. So although, yes, there will be a reduction in energy prices, and yes, that will hold down inflation, some of the other measures will push up inflation. So, so the two you know, will, to some extent, cancel each other out. Yeah. Um, what we are seeing, though, I guess, in, in better news, um, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we were looking at inflation peaks, people forecasting maybe 20%. I think I saw one that was sort of 22, 23%, which really is unheard of. I think now the peaks are being talked about are maybe near a 15%. So yeah. maybe some better news there. But still a long way off that 2% target. <laughs> and Alistair, I know you're going to be talking mm. about energy bills later on, but just interesting to get a quick comment from you off the back of what Shillian's just said. Mm. Indeed, so there were lots of surprises uh, when Quasi stood up uh, last Friday at the mini budget. The energy elements were less of a surprise. Obviously, some had already been announced. Mm. Others were heavily trailed. The point I would focus on is on the timing of those uh, of those price freezes. So government has chosen to intervene. Um, and for consumers, that's for two years, which feels like a long time. But for business, it's only six months, or at least initially, it's a six month period. I think it's almost inevitable that that, that period of, uh, of fixing for, for business will be longer and they will need to uh, to extend that. And that will obviously increase costs. Um, so I think the, the, the focus here is on, on time. And I think the two year uh, for consumers is significant, but even even two years, I don't think anyone should assume that prices will be back to to historic normal levels. I think we are now in a in, intrinsically higher cost uh, for energy at least world, and how government seeks to withdraw that support in a careful manner will be critical. But we may well uh, around that time as well have a new. Uh, a, a new government, certainly, and, uh, and perhaps a new party in power. So the timing of these interventions is quite significant and, and for the implications on on, uh, on inflation. Especially. Indeed. And you'll be talking about that uh, later on as well. So thanks that for, for the moment. Back to inflation, uh, Shelley, and more generally. And um, how can I say this diplomatically? There seems to be clear differences between uh, the government and the Bank of England um, in their responses. So what do you make of that? Yeah, so I guess it's worth, you know, starting with the Bank of England only has one aim, and that's to keep inflation at 2%. You know, it, it, its aim is not around GDP, it's not around, you know, economic growth, it is around keeping inflation at 2%. So I think that explains many of its actions. And it, it, as you said, it has several levers to do this, but its main lever is interest rates. So essentially, it has to keep inflation at 2%, and it does this by changing inflation rates it, up and down. Um, and it said it's really concerned about the breadth and depth of inflation. It's really concerned about the persistence of inflation. And again, worth noting, it's a really difficult type of inflation to control. So this is cost push inflation. It's outside of its control. It's coming from sort of global factors, external factors. Um, and if it was coming from consumer spending and then increasing interest rates can, you know, can, can knock that on the head quite quickly. This type of inflation is tough. So the bank's been really open that a recession's on the cards and that it will use a recession to drive inflation down. Um, and it's predicting a five quarter recession from sort of late 2022 onwards. And it's, it's been really open about that. Um, and now it's got to also contend with, with the government. So the, the government's, you know, giving us all these tax breaks, helping businesses out. I said, that's fantastic, um, but it's going to push up inflation um, it, it, you know, in, in the short and medium term. So the Bank of England is now going to have to push up interest rates even further in order to, I guess, bring about this, this recession while, while the government's obviously hoping that we, we stay out of this. Um, and I think it's really important, though, to also focus on the sort of social element of this. So whilst these two sort of institutions are slogging it out over, you know, do we go into recession, do, do we not? There's a real social impact here. And I, I know we were talking actually before this about sort of the late 18, 1980s and early 1990s and sort of some of the impacts that, that we felt in our families. Um, and, you know, as, as interest rates reach those peaks then, and I think it's really important not, not to forget that. And one of the stats that I read at the weekend said that um, there's... Um, of 
because the house prices are such a high proportion now of um, income. So, you know, in the 1980s, I think maybe sort of two times individual income was the norm for a house. Now, you know, we're, we're borrowing four, five, six times our, our levels of income and often on joint salaries. There's actually a 5% interest rate today gives you the same expenditure on mortgage payments or, or rental as a 14% interest rate would have done in the 1980s. And we're, you know, the Bank of England's increased interest rates. They're expected to go up to sort of three and a half percent by the end of this year. And they're likely to hit sort of five and a half, six percent by mid 2023. So you're talking about sort of similar levels of disposable income being spent on rents and households as you were in the sort of like late 1980s, early 1990s. And I think we should really hold on to that. So that these two institutions work out sort of who's top dog here. It would be it would be good to sort of not not lose that human element. And we'll come back to productivity yeah. later on. But that's sort of yeah. that growth strategy. Yeah the reason behind this so-called mini budget, yeah. um, if the productivity puzzle is yeah. solved. And that's where you can get the alignment. So if yeah. you can solve productivity, and I know I, we're meant to be covering this in a moment, but we're sort of jumping onto it now. But if you can solve the productivity conundrum, and if you can boost UK productivity levels, so you know, um, to, to those that we see in other European countries, actually you can get back to a state where you have um, increases in growth, and you can bring inflation back down to that sort of you know two percent level, and the interest rates will fall again. So that's where we really need to get to. We need to get to a position where we're growing our way out of this, and that's also the way to sort of solve some of these cost of living crises as well. Alison, did you want to make a quick comment? Yeah. Well, it was it was just to reflect uh, that we've been here before uh, yeah. on on productivity. Yeah. So uh, I worked for Greg Clark, uh, and uh, back in the time when uh, we we focused on industrial strategy, he put a huge amount of intellectual effort into trying to crack the productivity problem in the UK. Yeah. So conservative thought has focused in this area before. Has it delivered results? Perhaps not. Uh, and and there's definitely risk for the whole economy there in that regard. So we'll come back to productivity in just a moment. Just yeah. for everything else that you've said, um, Shellyan. What kind of impact is this going to have on businesses and consumers yeah, so far? Because yeah. I think that's what people really want to know. How is this going to affect us? Sure. And in a way, what yeah. can I do? No, it's really interesting because um, GT undertakes regular surveys of of um, of the market, um, and we undertook a uh, business confidence survey in. August and surprisingly, um, I think it was seventy five percent of businesses in August were still saying they were remarkably confident about about the year ahead. Wait and, till the next one. I know. Well, that's what I was going to say, and that was actually up from seventy two percent in June. So certainly in August, businesses, despite you know the headwinds of inflation and a tightening labour market, um, were feeling really confident. And there were a number of reasons for this. And I think the first being that they were finding that they were able to pass through those high price rises, um, you know, they had high costs. They were able to increase prices and pass that through to consumers. And actually, the majority of businesses in our survey said that they were able to do that. Um, they were worried about the um, cost increases on, on profits um, and how OPEX would, would sort of reduce their profit margins. But actually, a lot of them were quite confident that they could do something about it. So again, we'll come on to that later. But, you know, they were confident that they, were, they had an awareness of how costs were impacting their business and that they were able to sort of find those, you know, th those inefficiencies and strip them out. So businesses were, you know, reasonably confident. However, you know, whether they will be, you know, when, when we conduct the survey again in two months, who knows? As I said, you know, the budget gives on one hand, the Bank of England takes away on another. So, so, so who knows? But I think where the crunch really came was around consumer confidence and that decrease in real incomes. So whilst businesses were saying they were confident, actually consumers were less so. So you and I were starting to get really concerned about those cost pressures. And the GFK Consumer Confidence Index has been constantly falling sort of during 2022. And actually it's hit its lowest point since the 2008 financial crisis. So whilst businesses might remain confident, I think consumers are certainly a lot less so. And, and Sen, mm. this is right up your street mm. as well. And I know you're going to be talking about the cutback economy, but any thoughts at this stage? Mm. I think I think Shillian's covered the points really well and we'll we'll touch on our research that we did in the summer about the cutback economy and the different cohorts of consumer groups mm -hmm. and how those different cohorts are intending to spend less over the course of the next year. Yeah, indeed. And just back to that survey, because I do read uh, my Grant Thornton research. Uh, quite interesting that one in eight, I think, companies said that inflation rates at around that 10% yeah. would struggle yeah. with working yeah. capital. Indeed. Indeed. So indeed. But you're right, there was a lot of consumer confidence at the time. But interesting to see the next one, yeah. how that's changed, mm -hmm. um, if at all. Uh, I'd imagine it would have without <laughs> yes, I'm trying sure. to change the yes. research based yes. on the recent announcements. And actually, um, we have seen, haven't we, um, Shelley, in a reduction 
reduction in discretionary spend? Oh, definitely. You know, we're hearing reports, for example, people buying insurance. Um, you go and buy contents and building insurance. Now people are sort of not necessarily buying contents insurance. We're looking at renewal levels of subscriptions. We're seeing a reduction in, in, in those sort of subscription rates. So we are seeing consumers, and I know send this is your area, so you'll, you'll cover it more later, but we are seeing that change in consumer behaviour. And that's, you know, that's what you predict, you know, those those areas that are more discretionary, will, people will begin to cut back on. Um, we're also, as I said, seeing you know businesses reacting to us as well. So you know we, we advise businesses on understanding their, their the sort of impact of their costs, and they're looking really closely at what to do. And a number of them are saying, look, you know, do we what government support is available? So are there grants out there? Can we sort of start approaching government for subsidies, etc.? So we are seeing a toughening of conditions. And tightening labour markets oh my goodness, um, is yeah. a situation yeah. that is, you know, difficult as well. Mm. The impact, obviously, on recruitment. So, what are your thoughts around that? Yeah, so businesses are looking to recruit, um, and again, in our recent survey, I think you know, nearly all businesses, ninety odd percent of businesses, said that they were looking to recruit in the next year to expand expand their labour force. I know at GT we are, so we, you know, we, we share in the difficulties that businesses are facing. Um, and to put it into context, you know, unemployment peaked at five point two percent during COVID. We'd been a lot higher. If it hadn't been for the sort of government interventions, um, but it's fallen now to the current level of 3.6%, and that's compared to an average of 6.6% in Europe. So that gives you an idea of just how tight unemployment is, is in the UK, how tight the labour market is. And essentially what that means is the level of vacancies is broadly equal to the number of unemployed. So we're struggling here, we're struggling to expand the workforce. And partly that's because we're creating more vacancies, we are coming out of COVID. Partly it's because the level of inactivity has really increased during COVID. So people have shifted from sort of being either unemployed or employed to being inactive, and, and, and that's a problem for us. Um, in our survey, 80% of businesses reported either a tight or tightening labour market. Um, and the Bank of England recently did a survey on unemployment and pay, and the number one concern by quite a long way was around recruitment and retention, just not being able to recruit and retain staff. And that was followed by um, higher wages offered by competitors. Um, and we also know that businesses are struggling as a result of Brexit. So again, 40% of businesses have said that sort of tightening labour market due to Brexit is a concern. So you're right. I think, you know, recruitment and retention is sort of number one on companies' agendas at the moment. So how do you think, just based on what you just said, to expand further, yeah. this is going to play out for those businesses in, in the mid to long term? Yeah. Yeah, and that's a that's a really really difficult question. So, you know, in the short term, there you know businesses will be able to keep passing through some of those cost increases. How long for? I don't know, but they will keep trying to pass through those those cost increases in the form of higher prices, and they will also look to try and control their costs as they have been doing. You know, the depreciating pound is the problem. You know, it's it's pushing up import prices, and I think that will be on a lot of businesses' minds at the moment. How how do you deal with those in, increasing um import prices? Um. And in the short term, there might be some relief. You know, so the government has you know, reduced corporation tax. It's looked to increase in these investments. There, there, there might be some short term relief, but no doubt that they'll be struggling. And we're seeing them react to that in terms of their investment decisions. So again, a, a GT undertook a, a mid-market survey looking at where, where businesses, where mid-market companies are looking to, to invest. And surprisingly, it's away from technology now. It's away from ESG. And they're increasingly focusing on investment, on recruitment and retention. So it might be around well-being. It might be around bonuses. It might be around um, attracting staff. But that's where we're seeing those investment levels going. So we're really seeing a focus on, sort of, I guess, what matters. So I suppose, again, back to that productivity mm. point, oh my God, yeah. if you can solve that puzzle, which has been puzzled for a long yeah. time, and we're behind yeah. some other yeah. uh, major yeah. countries yeah. around the world, yeah. which is quite a surprise, really. No, and that's really what I think the mini the mini budget, and I hate calling it a mini budget because it wasn't a mini budget, yeah. um, but but I think that's what the mini budget was really, really trying to do. It was really trying to address that productivity challenge. And and let's be clear, you know, as I was said, we've, we've had this productivity gap for a long time. You know, since the Second World War, our productivity levels have been below others in Europe and across the world. And we're also seeing an increasing divide within the UK. So you've got you know, London in the southeast, and then you have those regions outside of, of, of that area. So there's a real potential here to, to increase productivity for the UK, for UK PLC, but also to increase um, levelling up, so, so to level up that productivity. But as Alistair said, you know, we, we, we've been here before, but ultimately with the, with the way the economy is at the moment, I, I guess the government felt it needed to take that gamble, it needed to be big and bold. Um, and that's where some of its policies are. So if you look around some of the changes to um, bankers' bonuses, you look at some of its migration policies. So it's now looking to attract um, 
high quality talent, highly skilled talent from, from other countries. It's also looking at increasing the number of sort of shortage um, occupations on our visa list. So all those are in, intended to increase productivity rates. It's also obviously looking at those regional differences as well. So the creation of those 38, initial 38 investment, investment zones. zones, which you know are intended to increase investment and employment, if we can find people to employ, um, in, in those 38 areas. And they're, they're doing that by giving tax breaks, tax incentives to those that invest there. And um, increasing in flexibility around sort of employment, around planning, etc. So the idea is that we attract, we attract sort of investment into those areas, and that we really grow our way out of out of this economic problem we're in. So that that's definitely what you know what the government's hoping. Fascinating stuff. I don't know about you. I'm going to be watching closely the next uh, monetary policy committee meeting. I think at the beginning of November, yes. unless there's an interest rate rise before then, as I think uh, Hugh Pill, <laughs> the the economist from the Bank of England was a personal who yesterday thought that there might be, but who knows? And I think many of us actually think that, although I think as Alistair said said today, if it was going to happen, he, he thinks it would have happened Have-by by now. now. So I think we ha- we're hedging our bets around standing Indeed. on this panel. Thank you very much. Um, and again, any questions to Shelley and then please mm-hmm. do send them in. I, I can see questions already coming in. So thank you very much for that. Alistair, let's go back to you now. Let's some, spend some time now focusing on the UK energy markets, as well as getting an update on the future of net zero. But before mm. we do that, as we've heard during the panel introductions, let's tap in to your knowledge and time during your time as a public servant in public mm. service. So can you share any insights with the audience on the recent appointments, please? Sure. So, so I think that it's, it's been quite an interesting time for, for reasons you've alluded to, but, but looking at the um, Conservative Party and, and decisions that the new Prime Minister has taken, um, after 12 years in, in, in power, there's a lot of talent and knowledge within the Conservative Party. And what she's chosen to do in, in terms of her cabinet appointments, at least, is to um, perhaps shun some of that and focus down on who she trusts. And, it, and it's, it's a cabinet that she knows she can rely on to make decisions uh, quickly and, uh, and to take uh, her direction and, and deliver on her agenda. And as you alluded to, it's quite clear why that is. A very short time to show delivery to, to the, to the uh, electoral uh, population before before the next election. So she was quite clear um, that the next election will be in 24. Uh, and so we all have a timetable by which uh, she will deliver. So she's bringing the people she trusts. She's known for a long time, uh, which do include Kwasi uh, Kwarteng and obviously uh, Deputy Prime Minister um, around her so that she knows she doesn't have to overcome perhaps some of the, the friction that has uh, appeared uh, around other cabinet tables. So I think it's, it's delivery focused and, and needing to demonstrate that they can quickly make change. Um, and that all happened really before the mini budget. Uh, and so um, the, the, these changes were were in place already. I think there will still be um, challenges. And I think since the mini budget, we're already seeing that in the press in terms of uh, concerns about leadership. But I think um, the idea was to try and streamline and, and be as efficient as possible at the centre. And without, uh, uh, no, wouldn't normally cover this, but I think it's, it is important to note, given where we are, um, that both of the most senior officials in the Treasury are no longer at their desks. So the Treasury at the moment has uh, Quasi as, as the new Chancellor, but a, a limited pool of institutional knowledge to pull on at the senior levels. Uh, and so obviously that, that is going to create uh, some risks. So I think there is, although we didn't see the, quite the cull uh, that we've had in under previous administrations of, uh, of senior officials, um, there is a, a paucity of, uh, of experience and, and that does, I'm afraid, potentially create some risks uh, for the new administration. Exciting uh, and, and obviously new uh, new approaches and, and new ideas to, uh, to take forward, but some risk as well. Indeed, and actually this week we've seen the Labour uh, Party conference taking place and some quite significant announcements. Just want to get your thoughts on those. Indeed, very significant um, and, uh, as we'll come on to, um, energy focused. Uh, we're, uh, for a long time working in energy policy, it's, it's not been, uh, uh, or at times it became front, line, uh, front uh, page politics, but very quickly dropped back down the, the news rankings. But at the moment, it's, it's sustaining. A green energy focus. A green energy focus. So, so I think um, the opposition's um, uh, keenness to see a, um, a new organisation, uh, Great British Energy, um, to, to, to kind of build up a public owned um, uh, generation business is quite strange because uh, right now we already have that. Um, the, recently, um, the previous uh, Conservative administration announced the UK Infrastructure Bank, which has a remit to invest in a range of different generation technologies. So at the moment, we're in a slightly strange position in energy policy where both major parties uh, in, in, uh, in opposition, but also in power, are broadly speaking quite aligned in terms of what they want to do. It's, it's capping uh, prices to, to protect consumers, both both uh, domestic and, uh, and commercial 
commercial, but also wanting to see a greater level of public investment uh, in the, the energy system and the generation system. So there is an interesting alignment actually behind the, the, the politics in terms of where they see the future for, for energy policy. And obviously big focus on net zero, um, the clues in your title. Mm. Uh, your reflections after last Friday's announcements and in particular how business might respond as a result, thinking about the audience watching. Yeah, absolutely. So I think um, it was a bit of a nervy time, I, I, I wouldn't lie, uh, certainly around the, the, the appointments made. But I think with Quasi going into the Chancery, I think it's really exciting because he does fully uh, um, understand and, and has dealt with, uh, uh, in his previous role in government, uh, the, the energy challenges. And um, it was important to note that net zero was covered four times or mentioned four times in the mini budget. So there was a risk, certainly, prior to um, the last couple of weeks that uh, Conservatives would, would seek to, to drop uh, a focus on net zero. Uh, and obviously, with the majority, they could choose to, to, to roll back uh, on the legislative commitments. They haven't done that. In fact, as I said, that they are doubling down and, and continuing to reference intrinsic homegrown generation from a range of sources, uh, but wanting to meet the net zero target. So I think um, it could have been um, quite a, a difficult situation. It's not that. And the key point now will be how much of the, uh, the focus is on net zero versus the panoply of other challenges that they have. They're clearly wanting to increase um, the indigenous supply of uh, oil and gas from, from the North Sea um, and also have uh, lifted the moratorium on, on, on fracking. So that I wouldn't necessarily suggest it's a it's a fully net zero agenda, but uh, it is important to note that net zero is still core to their thinking. And, and having worked very well, uh, very closely with Quasi, I know he cares passionately about it. And he, he is very keen to, to ensure that the, uh, the UK maintained its leadership position uh, on the world stage regarding regarding net zero. And I think there was onshore wind announcements as well. Yes, there, there was a number of uh, announcements which perhaps weren't in the headlines, but are, were quite significant. Again, odd that they came from a, from a, from a, a treasury uh, um, mini budget, non budget, um, but there was perhaps because of, uh, of Quasi's background, um, there was quite a lot of uh, in energy, including, as you say, the quiet um, uh, relaxation of the ban on onshore wind deployment in England. So Scotland and Wales have had a slightly different approach, uh, but in the, uh, England, it's been very difficult to, uh, to uh, consent onshore wind, and, and that looks to be coming to an end. So whilst fracking made the headlines and was, was pre-announced, um, they've also um, I think what you're seeing is a, is a focus on low cost generation and, and certainly onshore wind is the lowest cost form of UK based generation that we have available. So with all that in mind, what can businesses do to help sort of navigate mm. these headwinds? And I know we're in a high cost energy environment, but what can they do to make those costs as efficient as possible? Well, I'm, I'm sure many uh, people listening uh, within their own businesses are looking at this right now and, and it's challenging. Uh, obviously, we've um, the government has bought uh, everyone some time. Uh, now, those prices, we should say as well, the, the price cap for industry, the, the unit price is still, a, it's a big cap. It's a, it's a high increase from uh, 18 months or, or two years ago. So so this the, uh, the intervention perhaps required doesn't solve the problem. There is still going to be a, an increased concern across businesses of all scales um, that their energy bills are far higher than they're used to. So, so we shouldn't kind of um, uh, minimise the, the, the impact. The gap is helpful in limiting the increases, but they're already increased to, to quite a significant level. So I think what can businesses do? Well, limited options, but one is it's certainly self-generation. So um, we're seeing a, a greater focus and really in the UK that, that's on solar. So, so where, they, where um, uh, businesses have land space, roof space to install solar, if you've not considered that before, many businesses have, um, but that's definitely something to focus on. Lead times for getting that in, that kit uh, installed on your business uh, are lengthening in, uh, very very quickly, um, but absolutely that's one of the most direct ways is to limit uh, your dependence on needing to import electricity. There aren't many options. Not many of us have access to rivers to, to run hydro or uh, or desire to have um, uh, many nuclear uh, reactors in their in their back gardens. But but certainly solar power is one way to, to to help reduce those those costs. Indeed, and actually, if you're linked in with Alastair or, or Grange or haven't done so far, then I recommend you do. I'm linked in with Alistair and actually it was a really nice piece that he posted last night which covers off a lot of the information you just said but whether it's energy markets financing scheme energy efficiency and the green levies um, it's a really interesting article as well that energy markets financing scheme very quickly anything you want to talk about 
about that now? Really critical. Uh, it doesn't really register, and perhaps it's not necessary to, but but that it has been, and, and I know um, from our conversations in the sector that 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 was really a requirement. Had government not stepped in, and and it's not just the UK government, but but um, governments across uh, Europe are, are considering or implementing similar action. But if 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 government wasn't seeking to support the cash flow requirements of, of major energy suppliers, we would be in a really sticky situation. So I think that was almost a a requirement. Government really had to do something there, and it's pleasing they have. Had they not done, I think you would have been, um, we've obviously been through a period of, of energy supplier um, uh, businesses going out, of, uh, out but uh, we could have seen that perhaps exacerbated on a, on a much more extreme scale had it measures like that not, not taken forward. And I don't know if you want to mention as well the review of electricity market arrangements, a nice easy title, is it REMA? REMA, yes. Well, there's a um, the, the capping capping uh, of prices is is only ever a sticking plaster. It won't solve the problem long term. I don't think anyone, uh, and certainly Quasi, has has um, no expectation that that's the answer. So Rima, although not particularly exciting sounding, is really important because that's how government will, in time, make changes to the wholesale market, to the structure of the wholesale market. And if done correctly, then it should have the impact of reducing prices. Um, and it's, it's all focused on the marginal cost of generation, which in the UK is, is gas fired generation. And there's lots of ideas out there at the moment. And government actually for, for two years now has been developing this project. So it's not a new response, um, but you, you can expect to hear more, uh, especially if you're in the sector uh, in terms of, um, of government's plans um, for longer term, and it, it will not be instantaneous, but longer term reform. Uh, and that's dri driven through this, uh, the REMA, um, uh, review. Thank you, Alistair. So questions in for Alistair. If you've got any, remember to pop Alistair's name down with your question as well. And thank you for the questions that have come in so far. Well, let's move the discussion on and spend some time thinking about the tax angle and get Rachel to analyse last week's budget announcements and, and what the likely impact will be on businesses and how you can use tax potentially to plug the gap. So with tax in mind, Rachel, um, what are your initial thoughts following last Friday's mini budget, which I know is an oxymoron? So mini budget um, or budget for growth and um, whatever you want to call it was the biggest tax cutting budget in some 50 years. So overall, the measures were pretty much good news for businesses and individuals. Um, but invariably, there will be some sectors and those most vulnerable to inflationary and cost of living crisis who will feel that the measures haven't gone quite far enough, particularly um, to provide targeted support. Um, that said, um, it was a positive budget for business. So the reversal of the planned corporation tax rise to 25% um, means that the UK remains at 19%, one of the lowest headline corporation tax rates in the G20, which um, makes it still an attractive destination for overseas investment um, to put their money, um, particularly in light of the uh, ever um, depressing pound. Um, furthermore, the reversal of the um, changes to the off payroll working um, rules, the IR35 rules, um, will simplify things for businesses. And crucially, um, it may mean that um, it opens up the labour market a little bit to enable um, employers to better access the skills that they need as the battle for talent continues. Coupled with the reversal of the national insurance increases um, from November and the repeal of the health and social care levy um, means that the plans are helpful to facilitate um, businesses supporting their employees. So in terms of what can be done um, and what businesses can be thinking about, despite the government's stance on cutting taxes for growth, um, during difficult times, there are a number of more practical measures um, that can be thought about for businesses to um, generate cash savings and um, manage cash flow um, by focusing on the impact of overall taxes on working capital and on the bottom line. There are a number of early interventions that can provide some breathing space um, for businesses um, facing such uncertainty. So many of these do relate to good business practice and good housekeeping, some of which um, we've already talked about around implementing operational efficiencies, managing exposure to risk, reducing costs, improving your working capital and so on. And tax can link through um, into all these good practices. So for a couple of examples, um, we've seen an increase in tax deferral and time to pay arrangements um, since the pandemic, really. Um, when businesses are struggling, HMRC can often be one of the largest creditors um, with businesses being in arrears um, or forecasting to be so. 
So being able to um, agree a formal payment plan with HMRC can provide certainty um, for businesses. Um, and also about the recovery of VAT, that's a good one as well. Yeah, absolutely. So um, little, little tweaks and small things really, good housekeeping. So accelerating the VAT recovery on purchases through input tax accruals and then thinking about optimising your VAT return stagger periods. Um, also using existing tax attributes that a business may have, such as corporation tax losses. So in particular, given the, um, the pullback on the corporation tax rise, now staying at 19%, businesses who were carrying forward tax losses or were disclaiming allowances to maybe think about claiming in the future when the rate was going to be higher, um, might want to think about adapting their strategies. So um, I have a client, for example, who is now thinking about surrendering some of those current tax attributes, those tax losses to HMRC for a repayable tax credit now at 14.5% rather than banking them to, to carry forward in the event that it might have become tax paying in the future at a higher rate. So there are quite a few positive things that businesses can do and there's some really rich examples there I think the audience would really appreciate. Mm. Just be interesting to find out, do you think Friday's announcements went actually far enough? Could the government be doing more to support businesses? Yeah, um, so there'll inevitably be people who think that the measures haven't gone far enough. Um, Shillian mentioned before that it's probably created the biggest stimulus that we've seen in a very long time um, from a fiscal perspective. Um, but there is more that can be done. Um, in particular, there are opportunities to um, broaden um, investment into the UK um, because the UK has one of the least generous relief systems for capital expenditure um, pretty much anywhere in the developed world. So Rishi Sunak previously was um, planning to expand the generosity of tax relief that we have on capital investment and capital expenditure. And whilst the um, annual investment allowance being confirmed at remaining at 1 million per annum is obviously welcome news, um, there probably is more than you Chancellor could have done in that area. Yeah, absolutely. OK, so very interesting. Any questions for Rachel, do keep them coming in. So for the final part of this webinar, before I ask your questions to the panel um, that you're sending through Slido and to continue to do that, it's time to get Sen's thoughts on the implications of the cutback economy for the consumer market sector in particular, but also we're going to broaden it out with some really practical tips. I'm sure Sen's going to share that will apply to whatever sector that you're in, as well as talking about areas that management teams in general should focus on to strengthen your resilience over the coming weeks and months. Um, so Sen, um, you mentioned already about the cutback economy report, um, which highlighted the potential scale of consumer spending displacement that businesses might need to face. Could you share some key findings from that research, which I think the audience will find really useful? Yeah, absolutely. And um, just to give it the overview, this was a um, a really interesting, uh, we would say innovative piece of research, which involved uh, collaboration with retail economics. And we surveyed over 2000 people uh, in the UK to gauge their intended reaction to the cost of living crisis. Which areas were they going to be continuing spending? Which areas were they going to be cutting back? And we were trying to analyze based on that, what does that mean overall? for the level of spending that will be scaled back from the economy, which sectors are going to be more affected than others. Um, and it was fascinating. We identified uh, four separate consumer cohorts. So, um, you know, they, they range from the financially distressed, which is about 36 percent of, uh, of consumer households. Uh, we had the squeezed spenders. Um, you know, who are 25%. So for the financially distressed were clearly people who were being affected by the cost of living crisis, who were going to be cutting back on their spending out of necessity. So non-essential spending. Yeah, non-essential spending. Um, but clearly, you know, we've all seen the stories of how people are making some really tough choices around, you know, what I would class as necess necessary spending in terms of day-to-day -day routines. Mm -hmm. The squeeze spenders uh, was the cohort that attracted the most attention. The BBC in particular were, were fascinated with this cohort of consumers. Uh, they ran some separate case studies to illustrate it. So these are people who realize at the end of each month or the end of each week that their um, incoming uh, income is insufficient to cover their outgoings, but they still choose to continue spending either out of necessity to maintain uh, what they feel is a necessary standard of living or it's out of choice for a lifestyle and they're funding this through continuing to borrow 
They're funding this through running down their savings. So this was a really fascinating yeah. route because that cohort uh, is biased towards the Generation Z and the Millennials, so the younger age groups in society. And more likely to do the buy now, pay later as well schemes. Absolutely. Yeah, interesting, Absolutely. isn't so it? Potentially sorting out problems yeah. for the future. And I noticed as well, because I had, um, had a look at the report, comfortable, cautious. Yes. What can you tell us about that group? So these are people whose, uh, whose budgets and income doesn't necessarily mean that they are particularly challenged from a budget perspective, but they're choosing to be cautious. You know, their confidence has been shaken. Um, you know, uh, Shelley and earlier mentioned the consumer confidence. And a lot to do, all of this is a lot to do with confidence. So they feel that their confidence has been rocked back. So they're choosing to be cautious. They're choosing to cut back on areas of their expenditure. Yeah, and I think it was, was it under 15% are financially immune, which That's is a right. very nice 14, position. 14%, 14% who are, um, you know, in that sort of financially immune position, they are, uh, choosing not to cut back on any area of spending. Okay. But the reality is that uh, our survey indicated that uh, nine out of 10 households will be cutting back on their expenditure. And when we added up the level of cutbacks across the different segments, that indicated a displacement of consumer spending of about 25 billion pounds over a year. Wow. So which sectors are likely to be most affected and how exactly are consumers planning on cutting back? Yeah, great question. So um, we identified the three top sectors to being groceries, to being fashion, and also spending in the restaurants, um, hospitality and leisure sector. And in terms of how are people actually doing this, the groceries um, area is quite interesting. You know, we've seen the stories about Aldi and people's um, sort of, you know, drift in terms of their sort of their increase in market share. You know, they become the fourth largest supermarket in the UK. Indeed, I think the chief executive was doing the rounds and they'd picked up, was it 1.5 million customers in a 12 week period? So it's a real growth. Yeah, it's there's a real, real growth competition part, yeah. within, even though we want food and we're still as an essential part, it's it's not a, a, um, an easy one to, for those other big supermarkets potentially to hang on to those consumers. Yeah, and, you know, they've, they've been very successful in terms of their, their strategy and yeah. the the proposition that they're putting forward. Other um, supermarkets do exist, by the way. I have to exactly, say. yes, from a ground form perspective, we want to mention that. Um, so people are choosing to switch brands. They're choosing to take advantage of promotions. They're choosing to take advantage of loyalty schemes. So, you know, they're still, you know, spending money on food, but they're doing it differently. And that's one of the key points for business to take away. Uh, in terms of the fashion sector, um, you know, it was interesting that nearly half of all households we're planning to cut back their expenditure on footwear and clothing. And, you know, the Generation Z uh, within our population, who you would have thought naturally would be the people who would be spending on fashion, actually six, nearly 60% of them were planning to cut back on their expenditure in that area. That's a huge amount, isn't it, actually? Exactly. That's going to be significant. So given those challenges ahead, yeah. what should consumer businesses actually be focusing on to navigate these um, quite extreme figures? Yes, yeah, so it's important to see that you know, business leaders, management in consumer markets businesses are always used to dealing with very dynamic environments. It is always challenging and the weather will never be perfect. You know, there'll be some event that takes place. There'll be transport strikes. They have to contend with all of these things and they've navigated through COVID and now they're having to deal with this crisis. So uh, I would I would cite three areas um, and they're all really about the consumer. I know that sounds very obvious, but really understanding who they're target core consumer group is and really capitalizing on the value proposition for them. So that means focusing on their use of data. What data do they have to inform themselves to make the right decisions for their, for their, for their core uh, consumer group? Um, that might be data that they have within the business. That might be data that they have to actually source in from trading partners, marketplaces to understand. That might be data that they have to rely on some sort of focus group study, surveying to get hold of, um, but really making decisions for their core customer group based on knowledge, insights about that customer group. So data, really important. The second I would say is pricing architecture. Uh, Shelley and talked about businesses passing on this cost input inflation through the consumer. I think there's a real balance and it's really tricky deciding how much of that you pass through to the consumer, uh, to what extent. Consumers, especially in a really value conscious climate, are going to be um, put off 
by that sticker shock, sticker shock of a very sharp increase in particular items, especially if it's staple items. And if you go around the supermarkets, you can see this really selective use of price increases and how that's happening um, coming through. Um, the use of promotions, targeting that to when it's really required on the products that really matter to, to consumers. So helping the consumer, seeing that you know, you're on the side of consumers, you're putting forward and being uh, tuned into their value requirements. Uh, that's important. Um, so I would cite um, those two areas. And then fundamentally for me, um, I think it was touched on by the earlier speakers, people. You know, consumer businesses are about people. You're serving people through people. And you know, if you have a consumer walking into your premises to buy something in a retail environment or experience something in a hospitality leisure environment, you want your people to be engaged, motivated. So looking after their well-being, you know, supporting them, you know, the retailers like John Lewis through the pro proposals they have for looking after their the welfare of their people during the Christmas run and busy period about you know providing sort of meals for them. I think those are great ideas. So when you have the consumer effect, in, doesn't it? absolutely, you know, happy people are going to be coming across as happy, engaged to their consumers. I know this is all motherhood and apple pie to leaders in the consumer market sector, but it's going to be ever more important now. Yeah, the people ones are really interesting. How about by margin? Is that something that uh, you want to share some thoughts on? It is, and I'll come on to this more perhaps when we talk generally about how you could strengthen resilience in your operating model. Okay, yeah, it's something to consider, isn't it? So beside those operational uh, levers, how can uh, management teams send, strengthen the resilience of businesses through this time? And I think this is where actually even the advice that you've given on consumer markets does apply to other markets as well. This is where we can really look at all sectors here, can't we? Absolutely, and 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 fundamentally, if we step back and think, you know, what's this resilience for? You know, um, businesses ultimately fail because they don't have the support of their stakeholders that they run out of liquidity. So the focus of strengthening resilience is really to ensure that you have the continued support of your stakeholders. You've strengthened that relationship through this difficult time and you've got a robust platform of liquidity. So to do that, uh, I would cite uh, five areas of focus for strengthening resilience. So they would be your operating and business model, your financial resilience. Um, I would cite the engagement with your stakeholders, the engagement with your people and also contingency planning. So if I take those in turn, um, firstly, on the operating model side, um, you've, ha you've got some really good insights uh, from uh, all of us today around you know, operating model, thinking about different things. But I would say focus on scenario planning. It is going to be harder in terms of your top line, so revenue scenario. So planning for what would it look like for the business if revenue um, you know, is scaled back in a particular area or across the board or in terms of specific projects. Um, and if it's on a consumer side, it's quite easy. You know, you might you might have specific data around consumer groups. Um, what happens if projects are delayed? What happens if investment doesn't happen by your trading counterparties? How would you cope with that? Does that mean you need to scale back operations in a particular area, location, region? So scenario planning to inform what changes you need to make to your operating model can be important. So that's on top line. Uh, looking at buying margin. So that difficult choice, how much of this cost input inflation, um, you know, gets passed on to the end consumer or your counterparty? Because we've heard a lot has already been passed on from your business outlook tracker, but there's only so much the consumers can stomach. There is, there is. And, but in, the reality is um, trading counterparties, consumers understand there is a cost pressure. So in, a, in, a, uh, in an interesting way, it might present an opportunity for businesses who've held back from increasing prices for a long time. Actually, there is now a recognition that, you know, this is not sustainable. So you might want to pass this on. You might want to be quite transparent about this to your trading counterparties and engage in that conversation. So cost, in, cost input inflation, adjusting your business to that, your operating base, um, can this really be sustained in a time period where you've got lower revenue, you know, higher costs coming through? What type of cost base do you need to serve uh, in your business model. Um, all of these things are going to inform changes that you might want to make in your business. And it's about then therefore planning what are those steps that need to be taken right now or in the future if certain events unfold. And bringing this together um, is resilience in terms of your financials. So 
robust forecasting. Businesses uh, will have been very used to doing all of this during the past two pandemic years when forecasts and cash flow forecasts were becoming real sort of bread and butter routines within businesses. Uh, unfortunately, we need to be continuing that discipline. So whether that's forecasting using a three-way model of P&L balance sheet cash flow, or it's uh, in combination, and I would recommend in combination with short term, so a weekly receipts and payments cash flow forecast. And doing these forecasts, it's important to stress test for different alternative scenarios. So what happens if the revenue continues to slide by X percent? What happens if buying margins are squeezed further? What happens if our cost inflation for operating base goes up? Because we need to, we need to provide more support to our workforce. What does that mean? And assessing the implications of these scenarios and these numbers for our obligations to stakeholders. So what does it mean for debt obligations? Um, you know, what sort of uh, interest, pay, interest payments can be afforded by the business? So having that strong relationship with your lenders as well as well as your, your stakeholders, that's got to be a huge factor, hasn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. And what stakeholders want to understand is exactly what the business is doing. You know, how are you strengthening your resilience? Um, what measures have been taken? What measures are still to be taken? And in this regard, I would say it is really important to be proactive in this engagement. Don't hold back. Go ahead of asking your stakeholders for support. So you're already engendering confidence to them that this is the leadership team and a management team that is in control, that is calmly, methodically going through what's important, has assessed the implications of what's about to come for their business, and here's their action plan for dealing with it. You know, exuding this ahead of you know, going with a support asking, I really need your continued financial support. I need some additional support from you is going to be important. Bring them into the tent, you know, gain their trust and, you know, as I said, do it proactively. And they know it's difficult, isn't it, to have perfect foresight, but they yeah. are looking for credible and realistic plans, aren't they? Exactly. Easier, to, easy to say, but hard to maybe do in practice. And, yeah. and in your experience, is, is, is that something you can help clients and customers with as part of you being a restructuring partner? Because these are great ideas, but there may be some people watching thinking, well, actually, we haven't done this contingency mm. planning before. Mm. We've, it's just difficult enough running a business without having to think up all these different scenarios. Yeah. So if people need help in that area, is that something you can help them with? A absolutely. And, you know, running a business uh, at the best of times is a 24 hours a job, or some would say more than 24 hours job. So going through this, this type of challenging environment you know, gain the support in the areas where you don't have that internal sort of strength is going to be important. Yeah, indeed. And um, any operational steps to deal with really sort of to navigate and uh, mitigate against some of these risks as well? Um, cost reductions, maybe looking at SKUs, things like that? Uh, absolutely. So as part of reviewing your operational model and looking at your scenario planning, you will be considering cost reductions. You will be looking at SKUs. you know, narrowing the range of products that you're offering in terms of SKUs. So all of those things. Um, and I touched on it earlier, the people side of things. Yeah. Again, you know, it's going to be really important that we have an effective team around us helping us through this. And that includes leaders, you know, having a sounding board either inside the organization, outside having the support on certain areas where we need it. It's going to be important. Yeah, wise words then. I think Alistair wanted to come in as well. Well, just to add from a, from an energy perspective uh, within businesses, that forward planning and, 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 and stress testing, as, as we discussed earlier, we can assume prices are going to remain high for a while. One, what's called a silver lining, what, one potential benefit there is that the payback period on measures to improve the energy efficiency of your business, to generate uh, additional power locally, have improved materially. So there are things you can do to, as I said earlier, isolate yourself and uh, those investments, because they are, they will need investment, obviously, from your business, the period by which they will pay back has materially reduced very significantly in some cases, because obviously the counterfactual cost is is now much higher than it was 18 months ago. So I think there are, from an energy perspective, there's a limit to what you can do, but um, that forward planning 
uh, may help uh, that glide path and, and obviously uh, for your stakeholders if you're able to show that you're innovating and delivering um, alternatives and reducing your um, uh, your energy demand through through energy efficiency measures which isn't exciting at the end of the day it's you know it's lagging and insulation and ensuring your, your systems are, are efficient and modern um, it can deliver uh, it demonstrates that competence from a, from a management perspective and, and hopefully will return um, the investment quicker than it would have in the past. Shane any quick thoughts as well on what we've just heard? No, I guess, you know, businesses are, you know, Sen says businesses are really getting to grips, I think, with what's driving their costs up and, you know, Sen's working with a number of them to put in place those sort of pricing strategies, but there is other help out there. So we're working with businesses to, you know, work with economic regulators, to work with government departments, to work with local authorities, to explain to them the challenges they're facing, and we really are in unique times, and then to work with those sort of government entities on where that support's available. So I think there's a lot they can do themselves in terms of talking to lenders or the stakeholders, but actually, you know, government, local authorities are listening as well. Yeah, indeed. And, and Rachel, rolling back IR35, that was such a pain point when it was introduced. I can see <laughs> I those sides yeah. from yeah. accounting all, teams. All yeah, place, indeed. So yeah, um, so yeah the, 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 what resonated with me um, as part of SEN's presentation um, was the people aspect. So mm. employees are generally the business's most valuable asset, right? So how does the business function without them? Um, so it's important to fo focus not just on reward, but also on health and well-being strategies as well. You mentioned yeah, it before, yeah. Shelley. Um, and whilst salary sacrifice arrangements, which can deliver the cost savings, so tax savings for employers um, and employees as well, for pensions, bikes to work and um, electric cars still, um, they don't result in more cash in your employees' pockets. Um, so structuring a comprehensive and well thought through benefits package um, is a strong practical measure that employees can take to care to um, can consider to attract and retain mm -hmm. talent in these times. Indeed. Okay, well, thank you very much, panel, so far. Right, we've got some great questions here from you. So thank you so much for sending them in. So the first question we've got, is there a disconnect between the Bank of England looking to push inflation down and the announcements in the mini budget, which increases consumer mm -hmm. spending power, which we sort of alluded to mm -hmm. and discussed? But uh, yeah, I think it's a, I a really think big question. Said, yes, I think. And I think that's because, as I said, you know, the Bank of England only cares about inflation. That That's what it's there to do. And obviously, you know, it, it will push it, you know, push forward the recession or put to, to achieve that. Whereas obviously the government's doing the exact opposite. They care about the cost of living crisis. They care about the cost pressures that businesses are under. And, and they want us all out spending. They want us all, you know, growing. Um, but, you know, if we can get productivity right, which Alison says we, we, we sort of maybe haven't done in the past, but if we can get productivity right, then actually these two top dogs can come together and hopefully hopefully find common ground. So. Indeed. I mean, that is, as you said, that's their primary purpose, yeah. isn't it? To push inflation yeah. down. And it's, it's um, probably supportive language from both sides, isn't it? Is that possible, though? There is supportive language. And, you know, clearly the um, you know, the Bank of England stepped in today with its sort yeah. of you know, guilt buying, bond buying to sort of shore up the markets, which which will help the, the government. So there are definite things they can help, help each other on. Um, and clearly, you know, they both want low inflation, like the government knows as well that low, in, low inflation is a good thing. So they, yes. they want to get to the same place. And They're just going about it in slightly different ways at the moment. I suppose acknowledging the Office of Budget Responsibility would oh, yes. probably help as well. Yes, and I think, you know, it's it's interesting, obviously, and that's I think one of the reasons the markets are so um are so volatile at the moment is because we've had this mini budget and we don't actually know if it stacks up. So the government tells us it does stack up, that we can afford this um, and that we will grow our way out of this problem. It would be nice if the, you know, the OVR actually showed us sort of how, how that would happen. And I think the markets would stabilise if, if that's the case. I think that's key, isn't it? There's a yeah. huge question mark about how yeah. these significant changes are going to be funded. Yeah. So it, it remains to be seen and um, what the impact of that will mm. be and whether it'll be mm. very much a short term gain for some longer term pain. And it's really unusual not to have remember the OBR to come out at the same time as as a mini budget statement and I think we all understand that a lot of these measures were um, put in place at the very, very short notice so the OBR may not have had time to do that but it's really unusual not to have that reassurance. And I know both Sen and Alistair, <laughs> this question's got them going. Go on Alistair, go for it. I, I would just say uh, having worked closely with Quasi, I think he has a deep respect for the institutions of the United Kingdom so I know that he, he deeply respects Andrew Bailey and, uh, mm. uh, and the Bank of England and he's been at pains as people have mm. seen to demonstrate that class Collaboration, mm. obviously, that they are independent, and and, and yeah. uh, we won't see that change. So I think in the in the um, in the uh, forward mm. strategy that comes in uh, November, you will see a great emphasis on respect for the uh, budget uh, responsibility and, uh, and how they will manage those issues. So I think it's it's probably pain quasi in terms of the reaction that this has had, because I don't think he ever saw it as a confrontational. 
process. They have their political imperative, um, and, and the bank has its own yep. targets. And, and he's always he, he has always respected that. Worked with them closely in, in terms of uh, the COVID support period, where the Bank of England was was working alongside us uh, and Treasury to, to support yeah. business. And I suppose um, if the OBR had been included, then the reaction may have been yeah. a lot less extreme. I think that's the key I guess thing. It depends isn't on it? what the OBR said, but yeah. Yes. Yeah. Indeed, yeah very true. As said. I was just going to add, it's about that transparency and clarity mm. to stakeholders. And yeah. it was a great example to yeah. businesses in terms of, you know, how do you go about engaging effectively with stakeholders? And, you know, perhaps there are some lessons yeah. that people will incorporate from that. Some nice soft communication skills to be learned there as well. Okay, fine, great. Um, one for you, I think, Alistair. Is there more that businesses can do to tackle rising energy costs outside of installing solar panels? Although that was a very good idea. Well, so, so most most businesses procure their energy through a broker, uh, and so uh, yeah, and often on quite short term basis. So uh, it depends on, on which broker you're using, but there are there are lots of brokers out there. So I think you're always. Uh, as with many things in life, shop around and, and make sure you're getting competitive deals when your when your uh, when your current uh, offer comes up. There is um, the market is needing to adjust to to, to the, the the recent announcements. Um, that six month period is 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 pretty short from any business cycle perspective. So um, there will be a, a real pressure on it. Um, and I think preparing your stakeholders, uh, as I'm saying, for, for what will be a tough period is is going to be wise. Um, and then there's also the you know the the um, the impacts of uh, uh, currency and, uh, and the currency impact uh, therein as well. So there's going to be a need to, um, uh, from an importing business perspective, more costs will be coming in through through that system. So there's a lot of pressure at the moment. There, there is a relatively limited amount um, that individuals, businesses can do to move the yeah. dial. We've talked about some of the reforms that may come uh, in longer time. Government, this government, but also uh, the opposition have, have both doubled down on domestic generation. And whilst it will take time for that to come through, um, a lot of that is, is supplied by businesses in, in the UK. And, and, and so that's a, a positive message there. So when that the new build onshore um, and other forms of generation comes forward, um, we can hope that uh, the prices may stabilise. But it, 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 it will take time, but it's, it's not you know, it's not the 10, 15 years. Um, we can build quicker than that. And we've had very positive encouragement mm -hmm. for those sectors uh, from, from both the Chancellor and, and obviously opposition recently. And the yeah. currency is important, isn't it? Because we're yeah. trading in dollars when we're buying oil and gas. Indeed. Indeed. Yeah. And I think given the level of volatility that businesses are facing, it may have been they may have welcomed a longer than six month price cap, even if it had been slightly higher. I think they would have welcomed that sort of period of certainty. And the same I think for the energy businesses, like when you look at the retail price caps, you know, price caps of the sectors, they're usually three, four years in duration. So actually, I'm not sure how much impact six months will have. And I think a longer price cap probably have been welcomed by a lot of people. OK, yeah. And maybe that may be put in place over the coming weeks. Do you I, think? I think it's unrealistic to assume that, um, that that it will be six months and that's it. Yeah. I think, it's I think there will be more support. That. I think the problem is you don't know what that support will be. OK, and it may. I think um, mm. uh, we, there has been indications that it will be more targeted as well. So yeah. this is a panacea to solve yeah, exactly. the, so, solve a macro problem. Yeah. It's likely to be targeted in specific areas. Yeah. I should say as well, there are uh, major uh, energy users, so, so the heavy uh, mm. energy intensive industries, which which do have carve outs and some support already, they yeah. have been increased recently. So there is targeting mm. a, 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 of support going on with, uh, already, and we can expect a greater focus on targeting in specific sectors that are seen as key to productivity, perhaps uh, when the when the six month window is, mm. is more forward. Yeah. Okay. So how are lenders reacting and acting at this time is another question. What has been the reaction of lenders to the challenges ahead? Who wants that one? Send. I'll take that, Nadine, yeah. Uh, I think lenders in general, I think, have been supportive. Um, and at the moment, um, you, know, you know, they're continuing the supporting, supportive stance that they've had all the way through the pandemic. In general, UK banks and other debt providers have been supportive. Um, I think it's right to say, though, that they are supportive, but cautious. And they're seeking to understand better uh, the circumstances behind a specific request for, say, a covenant reset or additional liquidity, um, they'll be a bit more cautious. They will be more inquisitive, um, more exacting around the information that's needed from the borrower uh, to inform their decision. Um, and they will take some time to consider that. So uh, one of the key questions we get asked as, a, as an advisor to, to banks and corporates is, you know, how is this business sustainable through this cycle? 
it was a question that was asked at the onset of the pandemic, you know, can this business get through the pandemic to the other side? How will it sustain itself? And they will be asking that question. Um, they will be wanting to understand those five areas of, of resilience that I touched on. Um, you know, can the business demonstrate that? Um, you know, these skill sets, the bandwidth of the leadership team, have they got the experience to go through a difficult time like this? Uh, will be one of the questions they ask. Yeah. Yeah. And I suppose lenders themselves are trying to get to terms with what's going on as well. I know the chance was meeting some of the, the big largest mm -hmm. banks today, um, the chief execs this morning, yeah. trying to unravel um, some of the policies as well. So there's a lot of internal discussions going on with lenders and for them to then to translate that to, for their borrowing as well to mm -hmm. businesses and companies. A absolutely. I mean, um, you know, earlier in my career, you know, I've, I've worked on the banking side, helping banks restructure loans and um, work with businesses to, to navigate difficult periods. And I did that during the last financial crisis, um, you know, when the banking sector was properly challenged and had its own fundamental problems. Um, I think as we go through this, uh, I think it's fair to say now that the regulator, the government have a much more, um, I would say, uh, transparent, maybe upfront direction around the importance of all stakeholders being supportive. Yeah, yeah. Alistair. Just briefly, uh, one aspect of, of lending in, in terms of project finance, just to, to highlight another point of um, similarity between both the opposition and, uh, and the current uh, administration, which obviously is important given the, the short period of uh, until the next election, where we're talking about infrastructure, bo both parties are very uh, comfortable now with, with wanting to support large scale infrastructure programmes. Uh, both have large ambitious uh, agendas across a number of infrastructure assets. So project finance has a, has a strong footing uh, in the UK economy because there, it's unlikely that um, that, that, the, that enthusiasm will, will alter regardless of who's in power at the next election. So I think within the, within the project finance sector, there's an awful lot of activity going on, uh, whether it's nuclear power, offshore wind, uh, and perhaps even uh, the North Sea oil and gas sector, there's, there's an awful lot of potential activity. Yeah, fair play. OK, um, SMEs are having to pay energy suppliers via escrow up to six months utility costs to guarantee supply. How are Grant Thornton creating resilience if cash flow is affected? So thank you for that question. Who wants that one? Alistair. So, th so th that was one of the direct responses that the Chancellor made uh, on Friday, which we, yeah. we, we touched on earlier. So it's, it's, it's helping to address that, that cash flow concern that, that suppliers currently have. Um, so I think hopefully, uh, and we'll have to see uh, if the proof's in the pudding, but uh, the, there is an easement there. So it's not coming from Grant Thornton, uh, it's certainly not, but uh, it's coming from, from government and, and, and supported by through guarantees uh, by the Bank of England. So I think that is a that should ease the, the concerns there. And hopefully if the suppliers are in a, in, a, in a more comfortable position with their margin calls, they can then pass that relaxation through to their consumers, which is, which is the, the SMEs. Can, yeah, I, Rachel? I, I was just going to say, I think what we are doing as Grant Thornton is having those broader-based conversations with clients um, around what could they be thinking mm. about within their businesses, yeah. sharing ideas yeah. and insights. Yeah. And in particularly from a tax perspective, look, there's not a one size fits all solution for everybody. There are a number of measures mm. that businesses can think about to practically look at reducing their tax bill um, and managing um, the, um, the impact of um, taxes on their working capital. So if you have losses, think about utilising the extended loss carryback rules, which are in place now for looking back three years where before they were 12 months. Are you maximising all your tax reliefs, so research and development tax reliefs, capital allowances reliefs, to really try and unlock cash? Mm -hmm. So as a real life example, we've been working with a number of businesses actually to look back historically as to how they've treated capital expenditure for tax purposes and where they've had a large pool of ineligible expenditure for tax relief. Just doing a deep dive, looking, well, really, was that the correct treatment? And we've had some really great results in changing the treatment of those um, items of expenditure and obtaining tax relief now, because um, there's no time limit on when you can kind of go back and claim so those. So not six so. years, it can be longer. No, so for any item of capital expenditure, yeah. if you've not previously claimed allowances on it, you can elect to bring those into the regime to claim allowances on them now if they are qualifying. Wow, that's a, a really useful tip actually, isn't it? Send very briefly. I was just going to say, um, you know, a key point of, of, of ensuring you have resilience in your business is perhaps once you've done the forecasting yourself is to get someone to actually, you know, give it some proper challenge, some stress mm -hmm. testing and make sure you've incorporated all these emerging initiatives uh, into your forecasts. Yeah. 
I okay. guess just adding to what Sen says, businesses have some really great data. Um, and what we're good at GT, I think, is taking that data and understanding pricing algorithms, understanding consumer reaction, consumer behavior, et cetera. So I think businesses have great data. And there's a lot you can be doing with that to sort of use during these times. Yeah, so there's some great data yeah. there already yeah. rather than reinventing the wheel. Yeah. I'm just conscious of time as we sort of head into the last sort of five minutes of uh, this broadcast. Um, Grant Thornton survey shows business confidence remains remarkably high. <laughs> it was done in August. Um, remember the mini announcement was yeah. uh, done in September. Can that really be the case? case and will that continue? <laughs> I think I said I, I don't know you know, the budget as Rachel said there are some great measures to, to support businesses and ta you know great tax breaks there's incentives to go into these 38 in investment zones there'll be hopefully some relaxation to the tightening labour market as we see more migration um, as we see um, I think more announcements around how we get the inactive back into the marketplace so I think there is some real sort of support for businesses there but at the same time you have got that decline in consumer confidence so it's, it's about those two I think and how, how those two are weighed up. Great. Okay. Just, sorry, just, just yeah. to add to that, yeah. th there's typically a lag between sentiments, yeah. intentions and what's happening yeah. on the ground. I think we're seeing that yeah. with consumer spending intentions, yeah, confidence surveys mm. and the results of businesses. Mm. And uh, perhaps as we go through this quarter, uh, unfortunately, we'll see some of these challenges actually mm. manifest themselves in the numbers. Mm. Yeah, indeed. Uh, final audience question. What source of debt funding is still open to businesses in this period? So very quick response. <laughs> Sen, go for it. Um, um, Banks are still open, they're still keen to lend, there's a lot of capital out there, but I think they will be cautious and, um, you know, I would say the first port of call should be to your existing lender, existing stakeholders before you widen it out to other parties. Uh, if businesses want to have a more broader conversation specific to their circumstances, uh, myself and my colleagues can really assist with that. Great. Well, thank you so much for all your audience questions. Just want to get a final quick soundbite from all of you, and I mean quick, just to give the audience maybe some important points to consider because we've covered so much haven't we over the last hour or so so Shailene if I can start with you just a, a sort of a sound bite from you yeah I guess you know it's, 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 there is help out there so there's help from the government there's help from local authorities you can talk to your lenders there's a lot you can do but you really need to understand your business so use your data understand your business understand what your cost pressures are and then there is support out there Great. and let's hope the productivity gamble pays off um, yeah. that yeah. puzzle solved finally yeah. Alistair yeah, I, I think, and and to add to Shalin's uh, point, I think the, the the risk here is that, that businesses um, don't progress and don't don't move forward yeah. because they're nervous that they're going to yeah. miss something or yeah. something further yeah. might come along. I think you need to kind of demonstrate to your stakeholders mm -hmm. that they're, you're making actionable steps yeah. forward. So so don't don't let the the kind of overload of activity and yeah. there's certainly been a lot of announcements recently uh, lead to paralysis. Keep keep moving forward. Keep moving forward, Rachel. Okay, um, so in short, um, whenever there's a laser sharp focus on cost control, um, mm -hmm. it's important to make sure you're doing the basics and doing them well. Um, so anything that's going to be cash tax positive or cash generative should be a priority. Wise words. Sen, final uh, words from you. Probably four words. So your customers, your stakeholders, liquidity and your people. Well, thank you to our panellists. Thank you to Shelley and Rachel, Alistair and also Sen. And uh, please do get in contact with them if you'd like any further information. I know their details are going to be appearing on your screen or you can get in touch with your regular Grant Thornton contact, whoever that may be for you. Um, just so that you know, a recording of this will be made available at some point this week. You'll be sent an email with that recording plus a whole host of other resources, which, which I know you're going to find incredibly useful. So I'd like to thank you, the audience, for spending your precious time with us this afternoon. I hope you found the discussion useful and it's given you some really good ideas and tips and things to actually implement within your businesses. Thank you so much as well for all the questions and comments that you sent throughout the broadcast. So on behalf of Grant Thornton, I wish you all the very best navigating the coming weeks and months and um, look forward to seeing you again. Thank you for watching and goodbye.